Undeniably, the architectural prowess demonstrated in the construction of the Great Pyramid has been a significant factor in its enduring fame over millennia. The Great Pyramid, in fact, held the distinction of being the tallest structure in the world for over 4,000 years, a title it held for Egypt and the whole of Africa. This changed in the 14th century AD when the Lincoln Cathedral in northern England claimed this title for Europe. Despite this shift, it's evident that Africa and Europe once dominated in terms of towering structures. However, in the 21st century, there is a noticeable scarcity of such skyscrapers in these continents, with a majority now found in Asia and America. This can be attributed to Africa's historical challenges, including resource scarcity and colonization. However, the lack of such structures in Europe, the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, remains puzzling. Welcome, I'm Ahmed Mahmoud, and in this episode, we're discussing why there aren't many skyscrapers in Europe. But before we start, if you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell so you get our videos as soon as they're released. The Industrial Revolution, which began in Europe in the late 18th century, brought about a series of changes that fundamentally altered life. Among the numerous inventions and innovations, the Bessemer converter, designed by English engineer Sir Henry Bessemer in 1856, stood out. This device was capable of purifying iron to produce steel, and its discovery led to a surge in construction and engineering projects that relied on it. Naturally, Bessemer's steel workshops attracted industrialists and the wealthy, including Scottish-American millionaire Andrew Carnegie. Deeply influenced by the steel industry, Carnegie established the Carnegie Steel Company, which played a significant role in subsequent construction activities in America. However, in Europe, the birthplace of the steel industry, the idea of using steel in building foundations was initially proposed but often met with indifference and lack of enthusiasm. Europe had a tradition of limiting towering structures to military forts and cathedrals, while residential areas were typically occupied by single-family palaces and villas, reflecting the general taste and culture. This preference for independence and tranquility, coupled with class traditions that resisted large population gatherings in a single tower, meant that the idea of constructing the Eiffel Tower faced opposition and criticism from all intellectual circles in French society. They viewed such a sterile construction as a waste of French ingenuity rather than a demonstration of it. Even after the final design of the tower was presented, 300 French artists and thinkers signed a statement published in a newspaper protesting against the construction of the tower. They said about it, We, the writers, painters, sculptors, architects, and lovers of beauty, protest in the name of French taste with all our strength and all our indignation against the construction of this tower. Historians note that the French government's decision to proceed with the project was met with widespread dissatisfaction in Paris, with many considering the tower to be the city's oogliest building. Similarly, England, another cradle of the steel industry, shared France's views and began construction of a tower intended to surpass the Eiffel Tower in height. However, due to strong objections, the project was cancelled and the already constructed parts were demolished. In the United States, which was then considered a new land in the phase of construction, the idea of utilizing steel from Carnegie's factories began to play a significant role in vertical expansion as a measure to save costs. This was primarily because land, being the most expensive commodity, made horizontal expansion a more costly process. Concurrently, in 1871, a major environmental disaster struck the burgeoning city of Chicago. A massive fire raged for three days, obliterating more than 70% of the city's infrastructure. Consequently, the concept of rebuilding and leveraging the idea of vertical expansion emerged as the most efficient and quickest strategy for reconstruction. These efforts culminated in the construction of the Home Insurance Building. The Home Insurance Building was designed with the aim of assuring investors that the city council was ready to provide comprehensive insurance for all new structures. Despite only having 10 floors, this building was deemed the world's first skyscraper, according to the old definition. However, the term skyscraper was later defined with certain conditions, 
one of the most significant being that the building should not be less than 150 meters in height. The home insurance building was a great success, and it boosted people's confidence in high-rise buildings, contributing to Chicago's architectural prominence. The city's skyscraper peak was reached with the Masonic Building, which stood at a full 92 meters and was considered the world's tallest residential building at the time of its construction. Meanwhile, New York City was experiencing significant economic successes and financial market growth. Its population tripled three times between 1840 and 1870. Chicago's experience with vertical expansion construction was an excellent strategy to accommodate the increasing numbers in New York City. While Chicago began to enact laws to limit high-rise construction, New York's planning authorities allowed construction operations throughout the city. The Tower Building, established in 1889 with 11 floors, was a modest building compared to Chicago's. But legal facilities in the state led to the continuation of construction operations, ultimately shifting the skyscraper construction leadership to New York City. The Singer Building, established in Manhattan in 1908 and standing at 108 meters, was the tallest residential building in the world at the time of its construction. This title remained in New York for a full 66 years, during which New York skyscrapers alternated in holding the first place. From Singer Building, to Equitable Life Building, to Chrysler Building, to Trump Building, this continued until the famous Empire State skyscraper was built in 1931. This building held the title of the world's tallest building for a full 40 years until Chicago was able to amend some laws and construct the Willis skyscraper, which regained the title from New York in 1974. Returning to Europe, which initially insisted that high-rise buildings were a waste of European values and traditions, viewing them as soulless structures akin to boxes and lacking in general taste, we find that the intensity of objections began to subside. In fact, some voices began to call for the adoption of the idea of skyscrapers. This happened after the end of World War II, which led to the near-complete destruction of many cities in Europe. Additionally, affection began to increase towards the Eiffel Tower, which over time became a symbol of France. Furthermore, the Soviet Union, which was always in a state of challenge with the United States, wanted to prove the capabilities of its engineers and began to build buildings in many European cities. However, those who liked the idea and were enthusiastic about it were the Belgian capital, Brussels, which began to design entire neighborhoods on the ruins of some historical and heritage buildings. This issue made some Belgian citizens a little upset, and this feeling of annoyance was transferred to all of Europe. The European citizen wanted to rebuild the cities, but on the condition that this reconstruction would be through the restoration of buildings or rebuilding with the same old designs. This is because European citizens were associated with memories of these antique buildings. Although Brussels was building buildings that did not exceed ten floors, all of Europe was concerned with randomness. In fact, some people used a new term called Brusselization, derived from the name of the Belgian capital, Brussels, which meant randomness in construction and lack of taste. All European countries began to enact laws and legislations that support the preservation of the heritage character of European buildings. Many governments considered that high-rise buildings are a violation of the rights of other citizens. Because high-rise buildings block light, wind, and vision. These are things that are not the right of some citizens to take them at the expense of others. In addition, these high-rise buildings will have a bad impact on the environment. Indeed, Europe continued to maintain these traditions from that time in the 60s until the beginnings of the 21st century. Today, people are divided in evaluating the Brussels experience. Some look at it as the one that deserves credit for preserving the ancient continent's nature, and others consider it the first accused in the continent's delay from the architectural civilization convoy. During the period in which Europe froze its construction method, some Asian powers began to rise which were able to surpass America as well in construction, and skyscrapers spread in many Asian cities and countries such as Tokyo, Kuala Lumpur, Hong Kong, and of course Dubai. But in any case, as the situation is not constant, and with the era of globalization 
and the increase in demand for giant companies and institutions, Europe had to rethink and evaluate the experience again, and some giant skyscrapers began to appear, especially in the Russian capital, Moscow, and the number of skyscrapers in the European continent increased to more than 200 new skyscrapers. So, today we've discussed why there aren't many skyscrapers in Europe. What would you like us to talk about in the upcoming videos? Write to us in the comments. If you liked the video, don't forget to like and share. And for those who are seeing us for the first time, subscribe and activate the bell so you get our videos as soon as they're released. See you in the next episode. Have a good night. Bye.